When we're young, we have an amazing positive outlook about how great life is going to be, but somewhere along the line, we forget to dream and end up settling. Join Up Dots features amazing people who refuse to give up and chose to go after their dreams. This is your blueprint for greatness. So here's your host, live from the back of his garden in the UK, David Ralph. Good morning, world. How are we? How are we all? Do you know, if you listen back to episode 100, I was saying to you, the first 100 shows were great. They were remarkable. They were brilliant. But since then, wow, have we raised the bar. We are doing some stuff which is simply spine tingling on a daily basis. And how do I know that? And I feel that when we're actually having these conversations. But I used to think I got a lot of emails, but now it's it's an absolute tsunami. I can barely keep up with them. So what I'm going to try to do, I will try to contact you all. I used to do quite lengthy responses to the emails, but to be honest, I'm kind of running out of time. So don't think I'm rude. I'm just trying to deal with them, but I will contact you at some stage. And I really do appreciate all of you listeners dropping me a line, telling me about your progress, telling me about your fears, and telling me about that, that kind of leap of faith that you're planning because you've been inspired by the conversations and today's conversation is going to be wow it's going to be inspiring because this guy has had a life that is simply a film ready to be made he started life in Poland and it was fair to say that he's come a long way since then both geographically and financially arriving in the United States of America with just $194 in his pocket and a sprinkling of English he set to work with a passion Now, the entrepreneurial bug has always been a keen element which makes him who he is. So it was with little surprise, but a lot of hard work, that he transformed his finances by creating a series of business opportunities around California. First of all, he co-owned a collection of bagel shops and then moved on to running a multi-million dollar business that includes consulting, coaching, training and information publishing. But there was, of course, so many stumbles, falls and triumphs between them. Isn't that what makes a story interesting after all, as we hear on Join Up Dots day after day after day? And if you think that our guest is now simply a money-making machine who values wealth against anything else, then after the show, I guarantee you will think again. Because he believes that through hard work, perseverance, talent and passion, we can all design our lives to be what we want, the purest definition of success as he says in his own words when i say success i don't just mean money don't get me wrong financial rewards from your business are essential but they're not enough health family and friends spirituality contribution to others that's what's combined all together creates balanced fulfilled life and living such a life makes you an irresistible attractive success magnet So let's see how this happily married father of two has succeeded so remarkably when starting with so little by bringing onto the show to start joining up the dots of his life. And I can't wait for this one. The remarkable Adam Urbanski. How are you, Adam? I'm fantastic, David. And I have to tell you, this is by far, bar none, the best introduction I have ever heard of myself coming onto the show. And man, kudos to you for doing your homework and prep. I mean, you've unearthed details about me that I have forgotten. So I'm just deeply, deeply honored. And I, I shared with you before we got live online, uh, I am a little bit petrified about this interview because uh, you revealed that you're going to ask me to reveal some things that uh, just you know, might make me a little bit emotional. So, so uh, I've got my Kleenex ready and let's rock and roll. Well, yeah, let's rock and roll. And so in that introduction, are you sitting there thinking, I'd like to know about this person. This person sounds great. <laughs> absolutely i want to meet the guy yeah you should meet him i'll tell you what and i'll tell you what you could even sleep with him and i reckon he would let you (laughs) that would be fine in his book so you have had a life that is you know it's a film waiting to be made isn't it it's it's one of those ones that you would sit there for two or three hours in a cinema or a movie theater and you'd come out with a box of kleenex an empty popcorn bucket and think to yourself wow i've been entertained you know, I, I certainly did, and I continue to have. Uh, but, you know, if I can dive a little bit into my story, but, but I, before I even go into this, I think what's important to point out is, David, that everybody has a life just like that. It's just not everybody has the skill to go back and reflect on it, and not everybody has the skill to unearth the few turning points, the shifts that have transpired that are absolutely not just, you know, life-altering, but they're so deeply transformational and moving to other people if you get to share them with other people. So, you know, kind of like what you, what you shared, you know, I came to the United States, no money, no English, no connection, high school graduate, 
And just like you uh, described in the, in the opening, I had really nothing but a huge vision and a dream and an aspiration. I was willing to do do whatever it took within limits, uh, you know, nothing illegal and nothing just, you know, immoral. But, but really, in, whatever it takes in terms of hard work, perseverance, never giving up until I got what I wanted to get. And, you know, I think the disadvantage today that a lot of people have, especially the younger people, but also a lot of us, you know, older, we grew up not having to fight for a lot of things. You know, I, I'm, I've been, I'm truly blessed for having to grow up in a communist country where we had to fight for a lot of things. We didn't have, you know, basic necessities sometimes, you know, like, like uh, you know, sugar and, and milk and meat. Those were things that just you have to stay in line to get. We had to fight for them. Uh, we didn't have the right to freely express ourselves. So I grew up with that mindset of you you have to fight for something. You go in after something that you truly want, that you truly believe in. And I think a lot of people didn't have that opportunity to really fight for something. Things came too easily. And because of that, they're not quite as appreciated and they're not quite as recognized you know, as the blessings and transformations and shifts and turning points that we have. I, I think that is so true. And I call it the kind of American Idol syndrome, where people mm. think that they can go on stage, get through a few rounds, and then suddenly they're a multimillionaire. Where if you go back in the, just the music business, for example, people used to play clubs and pubs for years and years and years and work it up, work it yeah. up, work it up. And what you're doing by that struggle, that fight, that commitment, you're, you're sharpening your tools, you're learning your trade, aren't you? So when you do get the lean times, you've got the experience and you've got the understanding that things can turn around, which you won't get if it's too easy for you. Absolutely. And you know, you mentioned American Idol. Um, I'm actually a huge fan of the... Um, um, X Factor show. You've got, uh, I think, or you've got talent, or whatever it's called. And I think actually uh, the British edition of You've Got Talent is absolutely fantastic for whatever reason. It's a little less hypey. But you know, I actually play chunks of those shows in my transformational events. And here is why, David. To me, it's absolutely fantastic to see a person who comes on stage and may have just, they may have just finished working in the, in the restaurant, you know, peeling onions and, and cooking potatoes and, 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 and uh, you know, scrambling eggs. And, and they, they have this stink of oil and, and frying things. And they look kind of scruffy. And then they belt out a song and the entire audience is on their feet. And the judges, in, in the two or three minute time span, go from really taking pot shots at the person, going like, yeah, really, you're going to sing for us, whatever, you loser. And then the person goes on and just impresses everybody, sweeps them off their feet. And then what I really like, and this is where most people miss their train, miss their boat their entire life, is when they reveal a bit of a backstory and say, look, you know, I, I may have thought that I'm good. I may have thought that I've got a shot. But, you know, people told me I wasn't good enough. And then, you know, something happened in my life and I, I, lost, I lost the confidence. And I just, I gave up on the dream and I just went back and be a, being a fried cook or whatever it is for the person. And, you know, now at the age of 40 or 50, I'm coming back and, and, you know, and giving it a shot. And it's almost like, number one, they didn't know how good they were. Number two, they were surrounded by people who, instead of building them up, were tearing them down. And number three, they lost their own confidence to give themselves a shot. And I love those moments where they go at it they give it a shot and they go like, wow. And it really doesn't matter if they win the, with the show or not. It's the part where they just, they, they, the moment of accolades and they, the, the spark of confidence is reawakened and they have their, again, the, the, the courage to pursue what they may have wanted to do their entire lives, but where they didn't have the courage to do so. I think that those, that, those moments just inspire me beyond any measure. The word you said there was courage and it is, isn't it? Anyone who is in a life where they've got a dream in all these conversations we're not saying just by acting on that dream it's going to come true but if you don't act on it it's never going to come true and and you do need that courage to be able to break out of that envelope that you your, your comfort zone the mud or whatever you are settled in and actually break free and by little by little by dragging yourself out and start moving you suddenly realize that that dream in many ways isn't as big as you had already projected it it's just a series of small as we say on the show dots that will lead to something and once you get that momentum going really anything's possible would you agree with that adam 
Absolutely. And, you know, the metaphor that I often use with, with uh, students and clients in, in a business sense, that sometimes looking at the big picture is scary. It's kind of like looking at a huge mountain that we have to scale. And instead, if you're just looking at maybe a first level or first stage of, of you know, the first camp that you have to ascend, it becomes easier. But another metaphor I use is if you often look at planes taking off at the airports, you know, 99% of the time they take off in the completely wrong direction. And it's because of how the airport is built, winds, you know, the, the city situation, the, or the, the, the noise ordinance, whatever they have to deal with. But they take off in one direction, and as soon as they get to a certain altitude, the first thing they do is they turn around to actually get themselves on course. Now, I always talk about the fact that it's so much easier to change the direction of the flight in the air than on the ground. So just like you talked about, it's easier to just start taking small steps. Just you know, it's the, the body in motion has a lot more energy than the body that just kind of sits there, does nothing. So it's critical, just start taking the first few steps. And you know what might happen? You will realize that the dream you thought of is was close, but wasn't quite it, that something completely different will open itself up. And number two, that new thing that will open itself up, the opportunity that would have not existed had you not taken the action, is actually exponentially bigger, better, and more exciting than what you originally thought of. But again, you wouldn't have stumbled upon it if you had not taken action. I had a chap on episode 82, and he was so remarkable. I've mentioned this chap many times called Eric James. And he dreamed, uh, well, he believes that the bigger you dream, the easier it is to achieve because so many mm. people don't follow through. So if, if you really have a big dream, don't think to yourself, oh, it's never going to work for me. Everyone else thinks that. So just by taking one step, you're ahead of the game. And he told this remarkable story how he wanted to go up into space and take photographs. He's a photographer. And just by about five or six steps, he put himself in a 50-50 chance to do it. Absolutely unbelievable. Episode 82, if anyone wants to go back and listen to it. And it was just a, it was a state of mind. And he said now he's got that state of mind anything's possible and he has these absolute weird fluky things that happen all the time and he, he kind of thinks well, how did that happen but of course it happened because he was doing stuff and stuff happens when you're doing stuff end of story if you're sitting at home on a sofa just watching britain's got talent every day nothing's <laughs> ever gonna happen is it but by actually getting out and going to a stage show or, or something or other then you are going to meet people and there's going to be some kind of reaction by your movement Absolutely. And, you know, I'll share with you something else that, uh, you know, I deal a lot with people who want to transform the passions into, into their source of revenue, into their lifestyle. So, uh, and, and they kind of get some, you know, they concoct some ideas watching someone else going like, well, I want to do this, I want to do that, when they really don't realize that what they have themselves already is exponentially bigger and better and what they see someone else is doing. They don't need to be a copycat. So I talk about there are a couple of things that, that I want to that I want to mention. Number one is that in life, that which comes the easiest to us and which excites us the most should be the thing that we get compensated for the most. So, like in your case, David, I can just see that you've got a passion for connecting with people, interviewing, listening, unearthing things. And rightfully so, you're in a great place for being a, a host of the show. And, you know, you will be compensated greatly for doing this work, which you absolutely love doing. In my case, I love brainstorming business ideas and creating business models. I can do it half asleep in the middle of the night. And I'm still better at it than hundred, you know, the, 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 the thousands of other people. And I get paid for that the most. For the short amount of time, I get paid a lot of money for doing this work. But here's the problem, that most people will go through the entire lives not realizing what that area of brilliance is. It's so natural to us that we just take it completely for granted. And uh, to me, you've got to start paying attention to things when people say things to you like, hey, could you help me with... And if you hear multiple people around you tell you that, could you help me with, that one thing they ask you to help with, they perceive you being good at it. Or when people, when you do something, people say, wow, how did you do that? And you kind of go, oh, not a big deal. Well, <laughs> yeah, to you, but to everybody else around you, you realize they're looking at you like you're a magician. 
So those are some things to start recognizing what are uniquely brilliant at. But there's something, there's a story that came my way about John Lennon just a couple of days ago. And uh, I forgot the guy's name, but it was another band in the 70s. And a guy in the band uh, became friends with John Lennon. And he, he wrote a fascinating little piece. And he said, throughout many conversations, I finally realized one thing. And I realized that John Lennon didn't know who the Beatles were. He said, you know, I grew up just basically just loving and adoring and cherishing the Beatles beyond the words in a way that I couldn't even describe. But John, John Lennon never had that experience. He just never understood, you know, what transformation, what experience, what brilliance the Beatles brought to the world. Because he was one of them. And he said that he went on to discover that many people who are absolutely brilliant at what they do they, they reside like in the eye of the hurricane of the brilliance. And then one of the hardest things for them is to discover what that brilliance is and actually harness it so it becomes the vehicle for creating, for expressing the passion and living the lifestyle as they move forward. And I just found it fascinating because I think a lot of us are kind of like John Lennon not knowing our own Beatles. We, we have no idea what that brilliance is that the world is fascinated by. That, that's astonishing that because I had a email conversation with a chap last night. One of my guests who was on a, one of the earlier shows emailed me and um, just, just out of the blue and he said, David, I just want you to know I love your show and I love and he was just sort of like waxing lyrical about it. And I sort of went back <laughs> to him and I said, honestly, is, you know, really true. I said, because it's quite hard. I'm doing it and I'm just recording and throwing it out and recording and throwing it out and recording and throwing it out. And it's exactly as you're saying, I'm in the eye of the hurricane and it's it, the, the sort of ripples are going out across the globe. But because I'm right at mm. the centre, it's very difficult for, number one, for me to believe the feedback because it's kind of just something that I'm doing, which you say, you know, it's kind of, oh, so what? I'm just talking to people and connecting and, and then making these shows and sending it out. But when the feedback does come back once again you kind of think to yourself ah it, it, i'm not sure i'm not sure am i doing well enough and this chap said to me he said the trouble with humans and i thought this was brilliant he said the trouble with humans is we beat ourselves up all the time so what we <coughs> should do if you want to beat yourself up pick up a feather and put down the bat and I thought, what a brilliant phrase that. Yeah, beat yourself up with a feather because it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be amazing. But you can just do your absolute best. And with the Beatles, they did their best. And, you know, we all love the Beatles and most people do. But I, I take that point totally that when you're in the centre and you're churning out the content and you're throwing it out, most of the time you haven't got time to reflect whether it's worthwhile or whatever. So you don't build that connection of it that the listeners and the followers do. Yeah, so true, so true. And, you know, so that brings me to another thing. Um, you know, I talk about building support teams because if you cannot recognize your own brilliance, you know, who will, right? You've got to have someone who's willing to to be this reflection for you. So what happened, and it's so fascinating because how we are brought up, we're often conditioned to bring certain things into our lives, but don't we, don't recognize, we don't recognize we need other things as well. So um, I talk about four different types of support. So certainly we all need teachers, right? We don't know what we don't know. We need someone else to teach us. Now, another thing we need is we need doers. So there are certain things that uh, we really shouldn't be doing. We need someone else to do them for us. So, for example, you know, most people should not be fixing their own cars. You know, if you, uh, you, know, if, if you don't enjoy cleaning your, your, your house, you know, have someone clean it for you. So there's whatever things that are just not that they're beneath you, you just not made a, may not have the skill, the talent, but they need to be done in your life, right? So you need the doers. The third type of support we need is we need pushers. And oftentimes, you know, our parents were pushers and uh, the teachers were pushers. You know, if you were in sports, your coach was a pusher, which basically pushers are the type of people that, that say kind of like, you know, like let's say you started the show and, at episode 15, you were like, I don't know, this is hard. Nobody's listening. I don't get any traction. Oh, screw this. I'm just going to go and do something else. And people say, no, David, shut up. And you, you promised us you're going to record 100 episodes. We won't let you quit until you record 100 episodes. And so shut up and go and do it. I bet and there's like, many well, people that you... want me to shut up, though, Adam. Say it again. I bet there's many people that want me to shut up. <laughs> I don't know about that. I mean, there always are, but it's a whole different story, too, right? So we need the pushers, and we are, good, we, we are conditioned to find them. But there's one thing, one type of the fourth type of resource 
that most people completely don't have, and that's cheerleaders. And, you know, look at every sports team. Why do they have cheerleaders on the sides? Whether they lose or win, the cheerleaders go in there and just go, yeah, 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 go, guys, win the game, go get them. We don't have people in life that no matter what's going on, they're always there to affirm your value. And like you said, we as humans are wired to beat ourselves up. So we need exponentially more cheerleaders then we need you know, pushers and anybody else because we ought to do a great job beating ourselves up as it is. And when that happens, we diminish our own confidence, our own courage to go and do things. And that's where we need those folks around us who say, look, you're brilliant. You're good at what you do. You're amazing. You're, just, you're good enough as it is as a human being. Uh, you know, don't put yourself down. Go out there and do that great thing that you wanted to do. Go out there and get your dream. So kind of an assignment for, for our listeners, you know what? Find more cheerleaders in your life. People that just absolutely love you and adore you unconditionally and will always be there to cheer you on when, when you may be losing your own ability to, to uh, find confidence to pursue your dreams. But just before I take you back in time and we, we start looking at your sort of childhood, because I'm fascinated about your childhood in Poland and how you made that transition across, I just want you to have a listen to this very short speech. This is by a chap called Jim Carrey, the comedian that he made recently. What do you think about this? My father could have been a great comedian, but he didn't believe that that was possible for him. And so he made a conservative choice. Instead, he got a safe job as an accountant. And when I was 12 years old, he was let go from that safe job. And our family had to do whatever we could to survive. I learned many great lessons from my father, not the least of which was that you can fail at what you don't want. So you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. I love that. I listen to that on a daily basis, and it, it, it's spine-tingling for me. What, what do you think about that? Wow. Besides the point that I'm speechless and, and, and that I just love how you uh, weave those, those moments and quotes and, and inspirational speeches into your show. I just absolutely love that. You know, this is so true. Today, um, there is a, a persona out there in the social media, Gary Vaynerchuk, and Gary Vaynerchuk wrote this book called Crush It. And he says something to the effect that today, in, 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 in where we have so many opportunities, where everything pretty much is equalized in terms of access and opportunities and possibilities, there's absolutely no reason to, do, to live life in a miserable way and do things you hate doing. You know, I'm listening to the speech, and again, I'm reflecting back, back on my upbringing, and, you know, we were kind of a, an upper middle class family me grow, when I was growing up. My, my, father's, my, my, my father owned a bakery, and bakery was one of the two types of businesses that were actually permitted to be privately owned in a, government, uh, in a communist government. Bakeries and shoe, shoe makers, shoe repair shops uh, were kind of the only kind of like a cobbler industry almost. Uh, you know, so my parents were always perceived to be a little bit better off than anybody else. But let me tell you, they worked extremely hard and and struggle to kind of make things happen and they, you know how are you supposed to run a baker where often you cannot actually buy a flour to make bread so i've watched my father being extremely creative he, he was a genius man but you know i also watched him settle um because he was just beaten up and at some point he just had no more energy to really to fight the fight so uh yeah i, I think that for all of us it goes back to having the chili that people that will go like look dude Take another punch. Get up one more time. Uh, go for it. It's just not worth settling because, uh, well, just like that, that speech said, you, you may absolutely fail at the things you don't want to do anyway. So you might as well fail at something you love doing. Are, are your parents still around, Adam? Uh, my mom is. My dad passed away uh, 14 years ago. So was, did he get a chance to see your success in America? Uh, he did to a degree. Yeah, he was part of it when I was building my, my first business. Um, so, yeah, he, he was around. He was actually around when I, uh, I uh, purchased my first dream home. So then that was, you know, just absolute. It was, you know, for something people back in Poland were accustomed to, it was absolute mention. And they were just like, wow. Um, you know, and, and obviously the, the dollar uh, to, to uh, Polish money conversion back then was astronomical. So to, they were just, you know, like you kind of get, get to witness um, – you know a lot of uh, a lot of what I was able to accomplish, but I will tell you something. I do have you know kind of an unfinished business and regret when it comes to my father. It might be a kind of act you might be appropriate for us to talk about, because you know I, I moved out of my parents' home when I was fourteen. Uh, uh, my father and I were very much alike, very strong-headed, very driven, very opinionated. 
very kind of my way or the highway. So uh, needless to say, when I got to be a teenager, we did not see eye to eye at all. So, you know, my, my, my uh, solution to the situation was just, you know, get up and leave. And it took me until I was in my, um, what was it, late 20s, early 30s almost, where I had those ahas. I'm like, let me just reflect on all the things I've learned from my dad. And have I ever thanked them for it? And I got to tell you, it's like when I finally figured those things out and made a decision to go back and, and had a conversation with him kind of heart to heart and tell him how much I loved him and how much I appreciate everything he's taught me and showed me. Uh, you know, the guy died seven days before I was scheduled to meet with him. And uh, man, I just, to this day, I mean, I'm kind of telling this story somewhat uh, coldly, not to get emotional about it, because it's often hard for me to, to go through it. Uh, I was just so mad that I did not make the time sooner to take care of the important things in life. So, uh, you know, kind of one of the dots, and I know we're going to get to this later on in the, in, the, in the conversation, is you've got to do the important things right there in the moment, and you've got to get better at recognizing what those important things are right in the moment. I, I see my parents a lot. I see my mum and dad more than a lot compared you know I'm 44 years old and it's amazing how much I see them and if I say to my mum mum I love you she'll go what are you after or okay uh -huh. she never says it back ever and it's become a little mm. kind of test for me and I know she loves me I, I know you know from the bottom of my heart she she loves me but she never says it back and I never realized how important that was to me until my own kids came along and then I mm. realized that my family were very much they love you they support you but there wasn't a lot of sort of hugging and 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 sort of telling you that they love you it was just kind of an unwritten support and I had a moment with my dad when I had to go on a road trip with him um, to my daughter's wedding. And we was in a, a bar and we'd broken down and we was in France and we were trapped in this town for three days. And he turned to me and he said, you know, you're a much better dad than I've ever been. And I said, no, that's rubbish, dad, because you're the best dad, you know, I could possibly want. He said, no, in your mind, you think that, he said, but you're doing stuff on a daily, daily, daily basis that I didn't because I was so busy trying to build a future and build an income and all that kind of stuff. And it struck me at that moment, Adam, that a lot of my memories in my head of rose-tinted sort of memories, actually I've constructed because I think I wanted it to be like that. And I, I find it hard to actually sort of break down what I would need to address and what I, I don't need to address because I'm not really sure what is fantasy or not. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I can, I can so relate to that, yes. Why, why do you think as humans we do want our peer group to support us? But as been coming out on conversation after conversation, our peer group are generally the ones that are likely to hold us back more than anyone. Our parents are the ones that should support us and love us and build us up and, and really big us up. But quite often, because they don't want us to get hurt or failed, they will hold us back. What, did you, you know, your dad grew up in a communist country. Was he very stoic? Was he somebody that didn't sort of hug you and, and all that kind of stuff? Did, did he give you the sort of moral support that you needed? Or did you, because as you were saying, you didn't allow him to get that way because the two of you were at loggerheads? No, it's interesting. So I don't think he was one of those like really, uh, you know, the, the, the almost proverbial or, or caricature of a, of a Eastern European kind of hardcore man that, you know, wouldn't shed a tear, would be very kind of cold on, on, and, and ragged on the outside. You know, my father was actually quite warm, and, and I've seen him on, on a few occasions kind of shed a tear or get moved. Um, and, uh, yeah, there will be a bit, of a, a bit of hugging. We actually were, you know, kind of more of an, on an affectionate side. And just my biggest thing was that he was just like maybe your dad perceived himself my dad was constantly trying to provide for us. So, you know, he was just too busy to be there for me. Uh, I only knew, I have two older siblings who are significantly older, seven and 10 years. So I only knew from their stories that there were times when my family would spend time together and travel. You know, I experienced a lot less of it because again, my, my dad was always just busy, uh, you know, trying to provide for us and trying to make ends meet. But, you know, you ask an important question, David, and that was, 
uh, you know, why is it that we we seek approval? And I think as you know, as as human beings, we are wired to be um, herd animals. We were wired to be in a in a community, in a group, and so and and we perceive not having that acceptance as a threat. Now think about it. I mean, this is so deeply why I call it the, the you know the reptile brain or the lizard brain. And in order for us today to succeed, we have to find ways to hack that lizard brain against its own wiring. So the lizard brain is wired still from the caveman era. Now, in a caveman time, being a solo player basically mean, meant demise. You were dead. You were cast out of a tribe. You were dead that very night. You know, you, you, you died of cold, exhaustion, uh, exposure, or by wild beasts. You know, your choice, but you were dead the very next, you didn't survive very long. So we are wired to today that we seek our, you know, peers' acceptance, where in today's environment, it doesn't necessarily serve us anymore. In fact, you know, I've got five things uh, written right on my computer in front of me, kind of a five stages or five, five different ways to look at things today as entrepreneurs. So number one, there's like three sequences I'm going to give it to you. Number one is stop seeking approval. You know, because today what people perceive as absolute bogus and crazy and just totally lunatic, tomorrow it's a breakthrough. So if you see them to, if you seek people to approve your ideas today, you'll never have a breakthrough. So the first thing is stop seeking approval. The second thing is risk disapproval. Actually risk the fact, knowing into things that they're going to laugh at you. Yet that's just what, you know, you talked about earlier that there's probably lots of people who would want you to shut up and stop talking. That is always naysayers. But, you know, when you go into things that are exciting, that are new, that are fresh, people, especially those around you, you have to accept, you have to be willingly risk their disapproval. And the final thing, the, the, the third step to that is actually seek disapproval. If you want to be a thought leader, if you want to go crazy and have breakthroughs, if you want to really feel those butterflies in your stomach all the time like you felt when you maybe were getting a new exciting job or maybe before you kissed for the first time or you know found that that person you really wanted to love for the rest of your life if you want to feel that way you've got to actively seek disapproval from your tribe because if you're seeking approval then you're just settling for status quo and then i've got two other things that i wrote that are kind of along the same line is number one is reject acceptance and number two, accept rejection. It's a very, very important things that I, I try to ingrain myself with. Because again, if I, if I just nothing but I, if I again reject acceptance, if my ideas are readily accepted, that I know they're not revolutionary, they're not far thinking enough, and uh, knowing that the ideas that are revolutionary, that are breakthrough, that are far thinking enough, they're going to be rejected. That's just that's just what it is because most people just want what is. That's how they are wired. Man, that's kind of a long dissertation. I hope it made some sense. It makes total sense. And I was sitting there thinking about my own journey on this because it was an absolute leap of faith. I didn't know anyone who did this kind of thing. It was just not heard of. And so I had to create it right from scratch. And I think I've been through every single one of those steps. And I think I'm still going through those steps. And as the show is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, it it almost makes those steps bigger and bigger and bigger as well because when I started it I just wanted to get going and then once I got going I just wanted to get traction and once I got traction I just wanted to get an audience and now the audience is getting bigger and bigger and bigger I consciously think to myself am I providing for them am I providing what they want and mentally I have to think to myself why is the audience growing at such an exponential rate? It's because the content is giving them something. It's inspiring them. It, it's providing hope. And I can't give any more hope than I'm giving. But mentally, your brain kind of thinks, can I deal with this? Can I sort of keep on going? Can I keep on churning this out? So I think it's an absolute key point to all the listeners out there that to get anything going, you really do have to play back this this um, speech and around about the 30 minute mark listen to it and listen to it again and make notes because that is a blueprint for success that Adam has just provided to you and it's not going to be easy you will need courage but you jot that down and you've got more than a head start so thank you for that Adam it made perfect sense mm, awesome and you know just to make it even more tangible for folks 
all of us are probably on Facebook. And I want you to think about when Facebook rolls out changes, you know, it's always a huge, and you know, that's just one example, but it's always a huge uproar. And, you know, and people go like, oh, you know, Facebook is doing this and doing that. And funny thing, two weeks later, nobody even remembers what things used to be like. They just accept a new thing. But right when it happens, everybody goes like, because what do we want? We want the same. It's like, well, I used to go in there and things looked like this and now they look like that and I, don't, I can't find things. It's all, it doesn't make sense. Well, yeah, because you're thinking from a perspective of yesterday and seeking approval. They're thinking from a perspective of moving forward and they're willing to risk you temporary disapproval to approve things long term. Um, and I think that's, again, where we need to spend more time all as human beings. How do you overcome the imposter syndrome that stops many of us in, in our trap? Because you've got so many skills and talents that you're using on a daily basis, but all of those had to be fine-tuned. And so you must have gone through many stages where you think, oh, no, they're going to catch me out here, or this is too big for me, or I'm not up to this, or whatever. So how have you managed to overcome that and create such a world around you of success? Oh, you know, that is a fascinating question. Um, it, it, it certain, you know, so, so the first thing I'll share with you that, that imposter syndrome, or I call it a fraud factor. You just kind of feel like, oh my God, if people only figure me out, figure me out, they just, the whole thing is going to collapse. Right. I find it fascinating that a lot of successful people deal with that. And it's something that never quite goes away. It's almost like you, sometimes you have to pitch yourself. Is this really, I mean, am I really living this? Is this happening? Uh, oh my gosh, what are people thinking? Again, if, if I just wake up, it's all going to, you know, I, I think that we, the higher up you go, their intensity of that increases. So the first thing is you have to be aware that it's a very normal feeling. And it, it may, at least I think for me, it is for a lot of people that I know it is because we were, we were growing up with parents who were saying like, don't put yourself out there, just take it easy, you know, don't rock the boat. So it, it's very feeling, normal that we feel in that, not natural in that, in that place where we're getting ahead, we, that everything is just bigger and grander than ever before. For me, uh, you know, first I was just young and stupid, and uh, I had, I had, there was no place to go but up. I mean, things were so bad that I had nothing else to lose. So I think that's part of it. Number two, I had sort of, a, a, a kind of a blessing. I had a bit of a disdain for a traditional education, and today I learned to appreciate it but in a different way in a way that you know people put themselves through years and years and years of education uh, and I and I admire the discipline but I I had a, this I questioned things when someone when an authority said well you know let's say in 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 English class you know for me it was Polish we would be discussing a poem written 200 years earlier and and I would have certain feelings about it but a teacher said no 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 you get it all wrong here's what the poet was trying to say and in my mind, I would kind of nod my head, you know, because I, I had no choice. But I often would actually voice opinions like, look, were you freaking there 200 years ago? So how the hell do you know what he was trying to say? Maybe my opinion is accurate. Just because you went to school 10 years longer, you have an opinion that was shaped by, but I have a different opinion. And, you know, I think we should agree to disagree, but don't tell me that my opinion is wrong. And I think that kind of feisty devil's advocate spirit is what drove me. So when, for example, it came to starting a coaching business, I looked at people who spent three, four, five years, tens of thousands of dollars getting a coaching certification. And they thought they couldn't go out there and live their dreams, support the family, living the passion, because they had to be approved with a stamp behind their name. And I looked at the certification. I said, wait a second, how did this certification come to be? Oh, I see. So there were 10 people who were coaches. They got together and they agreed that you can't call yourself a coach or a certified coach until you have, you know, X numbers of training or hours of practice. And then you are, then you, then you are permitted. So basically, I, today I say, basically, it's a bunch of asses, people like you and I, a bunch of asses that got together and decided that you can't call yourself something or be something until they tell you it's okay. And I said, screw this, that's not true. If I want to be a coach, I can be a coach this afternoon, and there's nothing they can do about it. Now, there are certain limitations. If you want to be a you know, brain surgeon, right, or you know, a, uh, some sort of uh, rig operator, you can't just go in there and do it and go like, I'm going to fake it till I make it. You've got to have the trainings and certifications and so on. But there are many things in life where we just... We don't need other people's approvals, but again, through school, through corporate life, 
we've been conditioned that someone else has to tell us we are okay. And I've made it my life's mission almost to like say, screw it. If you want to do something, it's a wild, wild west. You get on the freaking horse, you gallop through the prairie, and you stick the claim, you know, you stick the stake in the ground, and you claim it to be your patch of your ground. And then you've got to arm yourself to the teeth and be prepared to defend it from the Indians and other settlers that want to take it away from you. So in life, you know, if you want to be something, you go out there and call yourself that. You out, you go out there and claim that patch of of territory, of industry, of recognition. But you know what? Then you better be prepared to work your hiney off to defend it because others will come say, you know, like people will come say, well, what makes you the marketing mentor? Did you go to college? No, I didn't go to college, but I've made millions of dollars and I have made tens of millions of dollars to other people. That's what makes me a marketing mentor. If you want a degree, go somewhere else. But people will take, will, will come, will take shots and will try to take it away from you because they follow the traditional route. They follow, they stuck to the status quo. You know, today, you know, I'm an expert. But experts are the most dangerous breed on the planet because experts stick to what they know that work. But, you know, if you're so certain that something works, you are blinded because you are not willing to explore some things that you, you are the, you're the decided, you're the know that it doesn't work. Until someone else comes along and do what they're not supposed to do and they create breakthrough results and you go like, well, how the hell did that happen? Well, they didn't know what they, what they couldn't do and they did it anyway. That's how it happened. So... I think the most dangerous thing is, you know, to listen to experts and for people like me who are experts, you've got to question even your own freaking expertise and approach every single day or you're going to die like a dinosaur. And what, you're a pioneer. And I remember a manager many years ago saying to me, if you're doing something new, people are going to take shots at you. And he said, all pioneers attract arrows. And that's, that's what yeah. you're saying, isn't it? Absolutely. Do you find that exciting, though, carving out your own sort of path, being bloody-minded? Because it it's come off in the interview, you know, I, th I think you're amazing. I really do <laughs> like your passion and enthusiasm and the fact that you do say to people, you know, or life in general, you know, screw it, let's do it, just get to it, you know, let's cut to the chase and let's m build this thing. Um, do, does, that, does that sort of annoy people or are they inspired by you being in your, in your vicinity? I think it goes, it cuts either way. Some people get absolutely annoyed and some people love it. But, you know, I have to tell you, David, you know, I, I'm not claiming that my way is the way. Everybody is wired differently. Some people just don't want it. Some people, you know, want to live differently. So whatever floats your boat, stick to it. But the point is, whatever makes you passionate, whatever just, again, floats your boat, give it your, give it your all. Don't just, you know, double at it. Give it your all. And in terms of this... Uh, you know, does it does it rub people the wrong way? I know it rubs a lot of people the wrong way. And frankly, I couldn't care less. You know, today, there's just, I mean, I could just tell you stories and analogies. I tell my clients that, look, no one has a, the only way people have a vote in my business is when they vote with their wallet or their credit card. If they want to just, you know, for example, I'll speak someone on stage and at the end, uh, people have an opportunity to invest in, in working with me or get a home study course. And then inevitably, there is always a person or two that comes back to me and says, well, you know, uh, you should have done that speech differently. And, you know, uh, I'm like, excuse me, number one, when was the last time you spoke in front of stage like this? <laughs> and number two, did you just buy my product? Well, then get the hell out of my way and make room for paying customers. Quit wasting my time. You know, you can tell me how you see I could do it better. But you know what? Everybody has an opinion. I couldn't care less about your opinion until you tell me you have out-earned me, out-strategized me, and out-maneuvered me. I have something to learn. Until then, you don't have much to contribute. So I think we often get so concerned about other people's opinions. And let me, you know, I think it's a quote from Dr. Seuss, something that goes like, those whose opinion matters, they don't care about the imperfections that you have. And they, they're not there to take shots of you. And those whose opinions don't matter then they will take shots at you. But, you know, who cares? They're not going to put roof, roof over your head. They're not going to feed your children. They're not going to take care of you when you, you know, have a medical emergency. Why should you care to what they think? But people do care, don't they? That, that's the thing, you know. And uh, these conversations are so driven to trying to inspire people to take on board what you're saying because it obviously works. And then the next episode, somebody else will have a different spin on it and it obviously yeah. works. And it's, it's just the flavour, isn't it? It's the flavour of, you know, 
not accepting where you are, not accepting the rubbish boyfriend, the rubbish girlfriend, not accepting the boss that puts you down every day. It's, it's that ability to actually create your own reality. That's what people need to do. And whether they're doing Absolutely. it your way or my way or the next way, it doesn't matter. It's in them and they've got to tap into themselves and find out the way that works for them. Absolutely. And you know, just one quick story. You've got to, you nailed it. You've got to do it. It's not my way. It's not David's way. It's not whoever's way. It's like, it's got to be your way and just be prepared that your way. Some people will love it. Some people will hate it, but that's exactly what life is about. Let me tell you, there's only one time ever that I dialed into a radio station. It was mid nineties. I used to own my chain of restaurants, drove between a couple of restaurants uh, to visit them. And I listened to the show on the radio, and there was one host that was very controversial. He was always just choosing controversial topics, and many times I disagree with him. I hated the guy with a passion. But, you know, he was, he was getting me so pissed off that I couldn't even turn the radio off or change channels. If I got mad, I clicked a different channel, like 30 seconds later, going like, no, I got to go back and hear what he says again, <laughs> even though it was making me mad. So there was, you know, one time only I doubt and argued with him on a show. But here's the point I'm trying to make it. Make people that love you will follow you. People will hate you, will pay attention because you just, you know, you drive them so nuts they can't find they can't find themselves to peel themselves away. It fascinates them when it pisses them off. And you know, there's this small segment in between the the, the, the nilly willy, the vanilla. And that's the worst place to be. Because if you find yourself to be vanilla, nobody cares. And that's where most people, how most people live their lives. They're vanilla and nobody cares. They're not driving anybody the wrong way. They're not just causing huge waves of excitement. They're just kind of pedaling along. And it's like a kiss of death. Come on, step up and do something freaking crazy. Some will love you, some will hate you, but they will pay attention and follow you. Just before we play this speech by Steve Jobs, which is the theme for the whole show, one of the things that's been coming out on literally every show is that there's a big dot in people's lives. There's a, there's a moment that they can look back on and say, yes, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here. And funnily enough, a lot of the times, that big dot is black. It was a dark time. It was something that didn't go right. But they, they're looking back, they kind of go, well, I really wish I hadn't gone through that because it was a dreadful time and I, I really remember it being dreadful. But part of me goes, yeah, thank God I went through that because I am who I am now. Have you got a similar tale of a big dot in your life that was dark at the time but you can reflect on it as a positive? You know, absolutely. So, uh, man, I'm trying to think which one to share with you. Um, you know, so there is a story that I always share coming to the United States with $194 making millions, blah, blah, blah. But there is a story that I haven't shared for years, which is after I've made my millions in the early 2000s, I've lost everything. I've lost everything down to having $20 in my pocket and driving a borrowed car that I couldn't even afford to put gas in there. And man, um, I was already in the, in the industry that required me to be perceived as success. Uh, I mean, I certainly knew how to make money. I, I've, I've, I've done it once before. And uh, it was just embarrassing. I'm in really dark, embarrassing. I, I lost my confidence that I actually can, that I'm good at what I do, that I can do it for a living, uh, that I can actually help other people achieve success. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I had both teachers and, and pushers and, and cheerleaders who just went, look, you can do it, you can do it. And out of that, what happened is a methodology evolved uh, or emerged at first and then evolved. That, that I use to, number one, turn my situation around. But today, it's, it's one of the primary vehicles that I use to catapult uh, customers and companies from often a standstill or a startup to hundreds or even millions of dollars very, very quickly. So, you know, and if it wasn't for that particular time in my life, I, I, chances are I might have never stumbled upon that, that particular method. It is, it's weird, isn't it, how that is such a truth across the world. And another thing that keeps on coming up, Adam, which is the tagline for the show is connecting our past to build our future. And so many people have started telling me that actually the things that they do now are fulfilling what they loved doing as children. So if they loved, you know, building stuff and Lego and building blocks and all that, now they actually like building companies. And it's the same kind of methodology. It's the same kind of tapping into that thing that you would do even if you wasn't being paid for it. Are there, there commonalities with you when you look back to the, the little <laughs> Adam that you kind of think to yourself, yeah, actually, I remember doing this kind of thing when I was a kid. 
Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I was constantly, um, I was constantly doing business. I mean, I remember as a four, five, six year old, I was roaming around, around, around the neighborhood and my parents never knew what would happen. I would come home with a goat or a rabbit in a suitcase. And they go like, well, how'd you do that? I'm like, I, I bought it. And they, go, and they went like, well, how did you buy it? You have no money. Oh, you know, I told people a story or I did a service of some sorts. I, I traded it. What did you trade it for? I told them a story. <laughs> so, so the first thing is I always kind of wanted to be in, in some sort of business and trading and making things happen. The second thing was I always wanted to tell stories. And, uh, and that kind of led to the third part, which is growing up, I imagined myself as being kind of an actor slash movie director producer. I imagine myself kind of having long hair and playing in the, you know, in action movies. And here's what happened for me. I realized that the acting career, not going to happen. Uh, the long hair, I tried it for a while. Now I'm, you know, bald as it gets. <laughs> uh, but, but here's what happened. I've created my own live events where people come and I'm an actor on stage. I get to tell stories. I get to produce my own show and I get to act in it. And because of that, I get to impact life, transform lives. And absolutely, it's, it's an extension of what I dreamt I would be doing. It's just I couldn't get hired as an actor, not that I ever tried. So I created my own shows and, and I get to act in them. It, it's, it's madness, though, that for so many people. And I, I was the same. When people would say, follow your passion or find your path, you kind of think, oh, I don't know what that is. You know, I've got no idea. But now I look at it and I think, I did know. I just forgot. And by taking responsibility and getting a career and going for the money and, and, and all those kind of things that we do in adulthood, I'd forgotten the things that I loved doing, which was almost playing. But now, as you said right at the very beginning of the show, for all the listeners out there, what I would recommend them all to do is get a bit of paper and just jot down. Try to remember things you did when you were little that you would just do all the time and you'd run home from school and lay on mm. the floor and you'd draw or you, you, you know, you'd make clubs up with your mates and all that kind of stuff because that, that's going to be ta ta tapping into your sort of real passions in life and that can't be sort of taken away from you that is who you are isn't it absolutely i mean that i think that's great advice i i never thought of it but it's a great advice david let's play the steve jobs speech because i'm fascinated to see what you think about these words because they are so powerful for so many people so i'm going to play this and then i'm going to ask whether you feel that they're relevant to your own life this is Steve Jobs. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path and that will make all the difference. Well, you've created quite a path for yourself. So is that true? Does that reflect your life? Absolutely. And, and you know, I'm kind of bracing myself because you, uh, you, you told me that this will be coming to the show. And, and yes, um, you know, just like we talked the metaphor of a plane taking off in one direction and changing in the air, and, and it's so true. You can't quite see ahead where it will take you, but I think what's critical is that you start taking the steps. It's like this proverbial, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? How do you go from, you know, New York to, to San Diego, vice versa? You can't see the entire journey, but you can only see a few hundred yards ahead, whether it's day or night, and yet somehow you travel a few, you know, a few thousand miles um, and, and it happens, but just a little chunk at a time. And then when you look past, you kind of go like, oh, my God, I'm so glad I did this. Oh, I'm so glad that this happened to me because without that happening to me, you know, I would have never been where I am today. So, you know, just one quick dot I'll show with you. Uh, in the 90s, I drove around a lot. And I, I you know, what happened is there, there, there are two things. Number one, I, I hired a consultant for our restaurant who got me on, uh, got me to listen to books on tapes. Without those books on tapes, I would have never found passion for self growth, self growth, and for uh, you know for transforming other people's lives. In the late 19, actually a couple of times throughout the 90s, I was enrolled to be a part of this company called Amway. You know, I never, I never had much success with it. Uh, and today, from perspective of time, I understand why. But through those companies. 
I learned the value of support network. Again, they were huge on education, on self-growth, on marketing training. Without that training, I would have never been in a, in a coaching consulting industry that I am today. And then finally, you know, like my own flavor of, of education throughout the 90s, there was a uh, radio show in the States uh, by Dr. Laura, Laura Schlesinger. I, I doubt that she's known outside of the United States. Maybe she is, maybe she isn't. But, you know, there was, she was always very short when she was coaching people in the radios. People would dial in to, to, get, to ask for coaching, for guidance on relationships. And number one, she had a knack for getting to the bottom of the issue very, very quickly. And number two, when people ask for opinions, said, I can give you the opinion, but who cares? It's just my opinion. Now, I can tell you, you know, what, what you need to do, what, needs, what works, what doesn't work, but it's not the opinion. And you know, I didn't even realize how much I adopted the same philosophy, like getting to the bottom of the things quickly. I don't, want to, I don't care about the story. I don't care about the umbrella. Like, give me the gist of it, and I can tell you what to do with it. And then the second part of it is if I know the situation and I can contribute, I will contribute. But you know what? My opinions are useless. It's just my opinions. You know, everybody has one. So if I, if I have a solution, if I have a tool, if I have a technology, great. If I don't, I'm obligated to tell you, look, I, I, I can tell you the opinion, but again, that's all there is. So just three things that I can remember, you know, and how they contributed to where I am and what I do today. So just before we send you back in time on the Sermon on the Mic and so that you can have a one-on-one -on -one with your younger self, what's in the future for Adam? What, what are you looking for or your planning or your passions that you're developing? Share with us. You know, this conversation is, is, is so timely because I think I'm kind of reawakening my passion for really playing bigger and, and, and creating more support for people. So, you know, today I'm on this mission to help people create their own playground. Whether you live your own life, uh, you know, whether you're employed for someone or, or you have your own business, you've got to become the, the king of your own kingdom, the queen of your own queenland, and uh, just absolutely do things that fulfill you. You read it in the opening as part of my bio. It's not just about making the money. It's about living an amazing, inspired life. It's about um, going places you want to go. It's about co contributing to the causes you want to contribute. It's about touching the people that are just kind of there in the haze, and they're waiting for the light through the fog to come out, and you know the fog to part. They go, oh, my God, I was waiting for that. Whether it's uh, a little bit of a how-to information, whether it's you know a, a, a dose of hope because they've lost all, or it's a bit of inspiration when they go like, you know, I've got no excuse. Uh, and, and I've got to go and do this. I'm inspired again to give it my all and go and do it. Uh, that's my mission, to help people create the playground, uh, their own playground, help people live the life they want to live. And has that just crept up on you again or has something occurred to, to reignite those passions? You know, it's sort of a little bit of both. Uh, you know, I'm... I'm <laughs> You remember you, you mentioned a conversation with someone a few episodes back where they said if your dream is not big enough, yeah. you kind of lose momentum. Well, I think that's kind of what I've been bumping up the best. And, and my, my, my circle of advisors are telling me, Adam, the reason you kind of fizzled out in some places or the reason you sound kind of flat or you're not excited is because you, know, you, you stop dreaming that big dream. You st the things you're going after are not big enough. They no longer excite you. They're no longer this big of a challenge. So again, you know... Um, that passion has always been there. Uh, what has crept up on me is the fact that I lost the connection with it and I needed to rekindle it again. Well, you're going to get it back big time. You can hear it in just the way that you talk. It's just there, isn't it? It's simmering away and something's going to happen and then suddenly, bang, you're on full flow again. Man, I'll take your words as, a, as the words of a wise prophet from, from the great land of, uh, of, of Great Britain. <laughs> you take it from me, Adam. It's, it's going to go big for you. So let's awesome. put you on the sermon of the mic. And this is a bit when we send you back in time to have a one-on-one -on -one with your younger self. And if you could go back in time, what age of Adam would you choose? Would it be the five-year-old running around buying rabbits and goats? Or would it be the older one just coming into America? So I'm going to play the tune. And when it fades out, you're up. This is the Sermon on the Mic. Here we go with the best bit of the show. The Sermon on the Mic. The Sermon on the Mic. Oh, this is probably one of the hardest conversations ever to have. But, you know, little Adam is not that little. Little Adam is in his 20s. 
and he thinks he's got the world by its feet and uh and he really doesn't know what's in store in front of him yet so i would say this you know as hungry as you are be hungrier uh but at the same time be patient and whatever big dreams you have you realize that they'll come your way if you decide right there and then that you are not going to give up until you get them and the final thing just three things be hungrier be patient and the final thing is that you will regret more the things that you haven't done than the things you actually do that might, might, might backfire or might be a mistake at the moment. So be hungrier, be more patient, and play bolder at any given time. I love that. And I hope the little Adam is listening. Um, Big Adam, how can people connect with you? Oh, the best way, uh, themarketingmentors.com. That's our main site, themarketingmentors.com. That's T-H-E, marketingmentors.com. Or just on Facebook, look up Adam Urbanski or facebook.com forward slash Adam's fans. And uh, I'm on Facebook quite a bit, so it's a great place to connect with me. We'll have all those links on the show notes. And Adam, thank you so much for spending time with us today, joining up those dots of your life. It's been absolutely inspirational to me and I'm sure all our listeners. Please come back again when you have more dots to join up because I do believe that by joining up those dots and connecting our past is the best way to build our futures. Adam, thank you so much. Absolutely. My pleasure. And David, I want to turn around and actually thank you and honor you for doing what you are doing because it inspires a lot of people you are like John Lennon and the, and the Beatles. You have no idea what um, what uh, Join the Dots really is and, and what you're creating out there. So kudos and keep up the great work. Truly appreciate that. Thank you so much. David doesn't want you to become a faded version of the brilliant self you were once to become. So he's put together an amazing guide for you called the eight pieces of advice that every successful entrepreneur practices, including the two that changed his life. Head over to joinupdots.com to download this amazing guide for free, and we'll see you tomorrow on Join Up Dots.